Let me read to you from the 23rd chapter of Luke, beginning with verse number 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Jesus said, Whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So this morning, please think with me about uh, the man who came to Jesus last. Come with me to the cross. Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place where death was, and yet where new life began. So here's where we meet the man who came last. A man on a cross. A dying thief. You know the story. He was, he was crucified with Jesus and a, a fellow outlaw. At first, both, both outlaws, they cursed Jesus. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew records that detail. And if the curses were all, that would be the end of it. I mean, after all, one doesn't usually focus on the words of criminals for theological reflection. But there was more because one of the men was changed. One of the thieves came to Christ in repentance and in faith. He said to the other thief, don't you fear God? We're getting what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then twisting his head against the, the rough board of the cross to be better able to see Jesus. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. And in a matter of minutes, they both were dead. The thief then was the man who came last. But Jesus' answer was always the same. Whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So let's focus for a moment on, on what happened in this thief. I want to think about what happened in terms of what the Apostle Paul's definition of belief is. Paul's describing belief to a group of, of religious, of, of church leaders, and he describes belief in terms of his own experience. He said, belief is repentance to God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's in Acts chapter 20, verse 21. I don't know anybody who better exemplifies those words, repentance to God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ than this man who came last. Think first with me of, 
of his repentance. He was the last to come, and he's also the last that you would have expected to come. Now, don't romanticize this guy. Um, legends have grown up about, about this thief, and, and they, they soften him. They, they humanize him. So don't romanticize him. For example, when, uh, when Mary and Joseph are fleeing into Egypt, the family was saved. This is a, a, a legend. The family was saved from death by the son of, the, of a robber chieftain. And they were spared by death by the pleading of the robber chieftain's boy. And as Mary and Joseph turned to leave, this boy supposedly said to the infant Jesus, if there ever comes a time when I am in need of your mercy, forget not this hour. It's this boy who grew up to be the thief on the cross according to this legend. That's a nice tale, but it's a legend. It is not true. The language of Scripture is very, very specific. The man on the cross was a hood. He was a back alley killer. His coming to Christ in repentance and belief is forever proof of the fact that God can send the, the light of faith into the very, very darkest of hearts. How did the Holy Spirit change this man's heart? I don't know for sure. Maybe it was the agony of his dying. You know, intense pain before death can cause a person to reach out finally to God. Maybe that's what happened here. Or maybe it was memory that, that changed his life. Uh, at, the, at the Montreal Neurological Institute, they found that the human brain never, ever, ever forgets anything. And they pointed out that in extreme situations, Something can, can, can strike the mind, as it were, so that a memory is unleashed. You've heard the saying that when, when, when people face death, that their whole life passes before them. Well, that might very well be true. Maybe that's what happened to this thief. He, he, he maybe remembered the prayers of his mother or the religious teachings of of his devoted Jewish father. We don't know. Maybe he remembered something like that. Or maybe it was the spectacle of the loving sacrifice of Jesus. You know, seeing someone suffer for someone else does strange things to you. He sensed the innocence of Jesus as he was dying. He, he stated that he knew Jesus had done nothing wrong. That could have been what did it. Or, or maybe it was seeing the courage of Jesus. Maybe this thief, when he heard that it was time to die, and when his time came, he would be able to face death with courage, and, and it hadn't worked out that way. And then he looks and he, and he sees Jesus and in Jesus, he sees courage and he sees strength that he would like to have, but he didn't have. And maybe, maybe that's what changed him. Or maybe it was the very first words that he heard Jesus speak. He could probably barely hear the words. Because when you are crucified, you don't die due to blood loss. You die by suffocation. And, and he's stunned when he hears the prayer. It wasn't about vengeance. It wasn't about the ruin of Rome. He hears, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Jesus was praying for him. I don't know what it was. 
I only know this. I know that the character of Jesus himself searches each of our hearts. It melts hearts. Let me say it like this. You know the story of the prodigal son. The, one, the younger son comes to the, to the father and says, I want my inheritance, which was really saying to the father, I wish you were dead so I could get what's coming to me. And the father gives him his inheritance, which would not have been as much as the older son, but still it would have been like, let's say, a third. He had what was, what was his, and he went off and he wasted it. And he, he, uh, he didn't spend it as he would, but he finds out that he's having to live in a pig pen, which was anathema to Jews. You don't associate with pigs. And he's needing to eat the pods that the pigs would eat. And the Bible says that as he's there, he came to himself. Now suppose as he's eating with the pigs, he said, Pigs, as you are, I once was. I can see myself in you. Now suppose someone had said something like that. Would, would, would he have... Would he have been helped if, if someone said that? Would, no, he would not have been helped. Jesus says that what happened to the son was this. He came to himself. He didn't look down to the pigs. He looked up to all the possibilities that, that were his. And when he saw that, that he could be all things that God promised him, then he got up, and then he went to his father, and he said, I have sinned, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. And it was then that his life turned around for him. And it was just so with this thief. When he saw Jesus for what Jesus was, the courage in this man, and the love, and the strength, and the compassion... The character of Jesus. Then when he himself is contrasted in that. Then and only then. He repented. The words would have been hard to hear. But they did come. I'm getting what I deserve. Jesus remember me. When you come into your kingdom. Those sentences said it all about repentance. First of all, it's the recognition of, of one's own sin. I am punished justly. I'm getting what I deserve. But that's not enough. The second sentence expresses sorrow. He says, I'm getting what I deserve. But that's really not enough either. You have to go on to the third sentence. There must be an abandonment of the sin and, and then claim that which is beautiful. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He claims a new commitment. He offers himself to his new king, Jesus. Repentance is an act of knowing, feeling, and an act of doing. I read about a, I read about a guy who, who hit the beach at Normandy on D-Day, 1944. And when the Al that's when the Allies invaded Europe. You know all about D-Day, June 6th. And some by, by some cruel accident, this, this guy, as he threw himself onto the beach, somehow his fingers got caught in the tread of a large tank that was, that was moving by. And his fingers were, were being crushed by the, by the tread. And his whole arm was being slowly pulled into the, to the tread itself, to these grinding gears. And in order to save his life... This man had to take out his pistol 
and shoot off each of his fingers one at a time. Either that or get sucked into the machine that would crush and kill him. Repentance is like that. It's cutting loose from that which kills your spirit. Repentance <clears throat> is saying yes. Repentance is feeling yes. But repentance is doing. And it is lonely doing. Because like dying, it is just between you and God. Being sorry before God is an act of repentance. Making promises to God is something that you do by yourself. <clears throat> Each person comes along as this man, this dying man who came last. You come alone. Sorry and not afraid to say it. <clears throat> Asking for pardon and for a master to rule and to reign in his life. That's what repentance is. So, I'd like to know. Those who have walked with Jesus longer than I have. Those whose devotion is much greater than mine. Why is it that there are some who are not ashamed of their sin, but are ashamed to repent of that sin? Why is it that there are some who are not ashamed of shameful things, but are ashamed to do that which is their duty and their only hope? Why doesn't the sight of a dying, loving, bravely suffering Christ melt the hearts of these people as it melted the heart of the man who came last? Why? There's, a, there's an old Turkish legend that each of us has two angels. One on each shoulder. And if you, when you do good, the angel on the right shoulder writes on a book and seals that book because when it's done, it is done forever. And when you do evil, the angel on your left shoulder writes it down, but then he waits till midnight. And if before that time, that person bows the head... And cries out, oh God, I have sinned. Please forgive me. And then begins anew. The angel on the left shoulder erases what he has written. But if the guy and woman doesn't repent, then at midnight, the angel seals the book. And when he does... According to the legend, the angel on the right shoulder weeps. The Apostle Paul says that the beginning of belief is repentance toward God. And we see what repentance is in the man who came last. But we also see faith in Jesus he stepped forward. He stepped toward Jesus in faith. He said, remember me. Think about the upper room. Jesus appeared with the disciples. He was there with all the disciples except Thomas. And Thomas said that he would believe once he could put his hand in the nail scars and in the side of Jesus. And Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. This thief was one of those. What did he see? He didn't see any of the earthly life of Jesus, and yet 
He was, the, he was the leader in that huge company who came to Jesus since the cross. I don't think, I don't think there's anybody who touched Jesus' heart more than this man. Jesus must have been so moved. Jesus, remember me. Have you ever considered that this is the only man who is recorded in Scripture by calling Jesus by his first name? Jesus means Savior. And all that this thief asked was to be remembered. The only throne he saw was a cross. And yet he said, remember me. This is the voice of tremendous faith. The Bible says that from the sixth to the ninth hour, from noon till three, there was a great darkness. But I believe that for Jesus and this thief, there was light. In that moment, he was the only person on the face of the earth who really believed in Jesus. The only one who believed. And it must have gladdened the heart of the Savior to have at least a congregation of one. He was the last man to come to Jesus. But the first man into paradise with Jesus. And that place is for us as well. Because heaven begins for us when we kneel before the one who said, whosoever would come to me I will in no wise cast out. Let's pray. Father, coming to a worship service doesn't make us a Christian. Having godly parents doesn't make us a Christian. Having a lot of Bibles in our house doesn't make us a Christian. Turning to you with deliberate, a deliberate act and asking you to forgive us and to set us on a path that is different than the one we've been walking, that's what makes a Christian. We pray that that would be so for each of us here. that we would give you thanks for what you have done. And even though we are not the first to come to you, that you, we would remember that you died on that cross as if we were the only person on the face of the earth. May we reflect today upon the cost and the great love and the sacrifice that you gave so that we might be with you. Father, we thank you for all that you've done in sending your son. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand for a benediction? Let's pray. May you go in the strength, the courage, the faith, and the love of Christ. May you serve him this day. And may all that we say and do honor him. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.
See you next week.